Hello, and welcome to Scurf Interviews. This is the fourth of the seven episode mini series exploring block science, crypto economics, and computer aided governance. In this episode, we feature Jamshid Shorish, who's a senior research scientist at Block Science, and Michael Zargum, who's the CEO and founder of Block Science, to discuss the role of formal methods in complex system design. As part of that, we explore questions such as what can mathematics tell us, what it can't tell us, and how it informs our expectations about what can happen, as opposed to predicting what will happen. Without further ado, here's the interview. Thank you, Jamshid and Michael, for joining us today. And just to get us started, would you mind please uh, doing some introductions? Sure. Uh, I guess I'll start. I'm, uh, I'm Jamshid Shorish. Uh, I am a computational economist by training. Uh, so I got my PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, and I've kind of had one foot in academics and in the, uh, in the private sector ever since. Um, kind of working now on uh, mainly on incentive mechanism design uh, through an eye toward looking at things like control theory, how things are actually created from the point of view or the perspective of trying to understand how certain desirable properties can, can come into existence. So it's a little bit of along the lines of what we're going to be talking about today. So I've been with Block Science almost, I think, about three years now, I guess, as a, as a research scientist. And I'm uh, Michael Zargum, Z for short. I am the uh, founder and chief engineer at Block Science, and my background is in um, electrical and systems engineering. I did my PhD to focus on uh, optimization and control of distributed networks. Um, and today, when we're talking about mathematical methods applied to mechanism design, we'll be sort of addressing some of the same like core concepts that arise from applying systems engineering methodologies to um, large-scale automated systems. Yeah, thank you both. And before we dive into some of the, the formal method components and some elements like that, I think it would be helpful to maybe start off with talking about some uh, complex system property design and what is sort of the difference between understanding how a system behaves in the first place and knowing how to actually get that system to behave in that kind of way. I can kind of start off with sort of a, just a in a way, a parable of kind of engineering a system that you actually interact with on a, on a regular basis, such that it kind of becomes the, the focal point for what you believe you know about the system, something like a, a mobile telephone, for example. We, we all use it. We know exactly the properties that we would like it to have. We understand that people actually work hard to generate those properties, but most people have no idea how you actually engineer the system such that you actually are able to guarantee within a certain specified tolerance for error, the properties that everybody would like to have. And so this separation between the familiarity of the system and what it is that goes into figuring out how to create or craft that system so it actually exhibits those properties uh, is part of what formal methods in, in complex systems has to offer. Yeah, I tend to try to think about things in three, um, like, in three views. So like um, there's the view of where you think about the thing itself, right? Like it's the, it's the object that you um, you hold or use or mechanism that you interact with. And then from that view, there's a, a view that zooms out and a view that zooms in. Um, if we go to the view that zooms in, it sort of speaks to the collection of systems that make up that system. So that thing that you interact with, um, my fa one of my favorite analogies for that is actually a analog watch. Um, you you can sort of imagine the well encompassed sort of analog watch that that keeps time, um, but inside of it, it's you know a, a very complex uh, mechanical assemblage. You could say complicated assemblage of um, of springs and gears and um, a wide range of um, of technical deterministic instrumentation, um, but that you're completely agnostic to um, most of that as a consumer of the the timekeeping device. Um, and then if you actually wanted to zoom out instead of in, you get sort of what system the the watch is a um, a piece of, and, and that system in, in generally involves you, the the person who's who's possessing the watch, and the the circumstances under which you need to know what time it is, and you know if it's a fancy watch, maybe it has some signaling properties, but like there's a you know notion of of the object, and it, it is both the um, 
the sum of a bunch of components engineered to make up a system, but but it also doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists within a broader system. Um, and in particular, when we're talking about mechanism design, you know, we have a tendency to impose a pretty deterministic lens on the inner workings, the mathematical bits, the mechanistic elements. Um, but then a lot of the times the actual um, value of the thing is is not really determined by that. It's determined by um, how those mechanisms fit within a broader context. And often that broader context is more open-ended and less deterministic. So having this sort of three lenses, the, the thing itself and its properties, the, the subsystems or components that make it up, but also the sort of greater system of which um, that thing is itself a component or a subsystem. Um, and by moving between those through views, you can kind of get a better sense of the overall requirements for designing something and get out of a sort of um, sometimes like get, you can get stuck in a, in a box thinking about it purely from the mechanistic view without the, um, say, contextual view. And I guess in the, this conversation overall in this podcast episode name will be the role of formal methods in, in in understanding complex system design. So it would also be good just to have a, a clear definition of uh, what you see as formal methods being, especially with that breakdown that you were just mentioning. From one perspective, and it's, it's only one method of kind of encapsulating that ability to, to scale down and scale up that, that Zardin was just mentioning, is to kind of view the system as something that has a particular state at one point in time and then changes over time. And so one of the formalization layers that can be put into this that can allow an understanding of how to design a mechanism to see certain properties is to understand this as a dynamical system, as a system which changes over time. And uh, one of the useful tools that has been used, of course, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries has been to examine how things change incrementally over time, a difference or a differential equation. This can actually be generalized to more complicated structures that change over time uh, through a particular, from a historical lens, a very fruitful avenue of research called generalized dynamical systems. We won't go into the formalisms of that, but it is just a way of thinking about how complicated structures can change and adjust their, uh, their values over time, with or without particular inputs from the environment or from other users. And the way that you use these tools to create uh, mechanisms or, you know, to create mechanisms which exhibit properties at the system level involves uh, generally concepts called uh, invariants or identities. Um, they can have different flavors. I generally use an identity for something that is sort of absolute in, in the sense of like a no double spends on Bitcoin, um, but then an invariant is something closer to an energy function, which um, in practice means that it might actually have some variation in it, but that, that variation is controlled. Uh, for folks with a sort of Web3 background, you might look at the, the constant function market makers that are implemented in smart contracts. They have what is essentially energy level sets often referred to as invariants or constant functions, and those constant functions are not actually constant because of the presence of uh, small fees that generate uh, returns for liquidity providers. And the reason why it's still relevant to call them invariants is because they work like energy conservation equations. Insofar as they are not equal, they have a well-defined source or sink, basically, that you're conserving their flows, even if you are allowing your system to have boundaries over which flow comes in or out, you haven't actually gained or lost any of it. You've kept track of exactly where it's come from and where it's gone. To follow up with one more general question on formal methods, I know in my own interaction with the topic, uh, actually while also at CMU, was much more on the uh, known execution of code and in a much kind of, a, I think, narrower context than what we're talking about now. So there, there are very two distinct but related concepts in systems engineering of which the known execution of code is one. So there's they're called validation and verification. So if you were to study any like large scale systems engineering, aerospace, Space, like large infrastructure systems, cyber physical systems, etc. Um, what you would be taught is this V, and it has this nesting of sort of high level design all the way down to the low level component design, and then you build up and you basically implement and compose and aggregate and test until you come up to a system that actually meets the intended requirements from the original high level design. But in that V process, at every stage, you have this um, sort of 
sort of part whole relationship that that uh, relates systems to components, and you have this testing type regime that that recognizes the sort of inward um, verification, which basically says the thing that I made satisfies the spec for it. It, it behaves as intended. Um, and validation sort of looks outward. So when I when I talked about inward and outward, these aren't like arbitrary concepts. Validation is outward looking, verification is inward looking. And so most of the time people who build software focus on verification as a, as a formal method and they talk about it in great length using, um, you know, basically code co correctness provers. Uh, you know, there's, um, formal methods designed to assert that the code produces exactly the behaviors that are, were specified for it. But that type of um, verification leaves out the question of whether that was actually the right code to execute. And so its complementary concept of validation relates not to whether it was implemented correctly, but as to whether the correct thing was implemented. And it always appears as a pair whenever you're dealing with systems that are more than one layer. You I mean, even a single layer system, you should do both, um, you know, define requirements, define specifications, implement specifications, verify that the implementation matches the specifications, and then validate that the implemented thing fulfills the desired requirements or functions in that system. Um, and again, that's the inward and outward view. So when you start stacking things, when you build big complex systems where there are many components, and it might not even be just a layering, it might actually be a network of dependencies, relations between components or subsystems, there's basically no way that you're going to get um, a meaningful composed system with desirable properties if you can't do this sort of validation verification um, nesting thing. And it's the kind of essence of applying what I would call, you know, formal methods in, in systems engineering with the caveat that um, the mathematical formalisms tend to live between a uh, specification uh, and verification. So being able to show that you formally that your implementation precisely matches a formal spec. But the other place where we use formal methods, and in fact, where much of our work resides, is determining what what kind of emergent properties are actually guaranteeable and under what um, and under what conditions. And those are also things that you can prove, but they look outward. And so that validation side of the equation is also a bigger part of the design workflow. As you can kind of imagine, if you're looking inward, you had to already build something. You had to already specify something. And if you've already specified it, then um, that implies that someone designed it, which implies that they had some intent. And if you're only doing verification style formal methods, you're not actually doing formal methods in design. You're only doing formal methods in testing. So I wanted to come back to a, a topic that was already uh, broached in terms of generalized dynamical systems and thinking then, and thank you for providing that context, uh, color and context. Uh, and so coming back to then uh, GDS and when viewing it through the lens of uh, applied mathematics and thinking how that uh, might play a certain role in facilitating the discovery uh, of uh, sort of composability or the relationships between some of the system entities and what properties can or cannot be expected to have, as you were starting to allude to. So yeah, it would be great to just get a little more color with how that links back to the the GDS or generalized dynamical systems that were mentioned before. Yeah, I think that um, quite a lot of what, what, what Zargon was mentioning with regard to how it is that you get that flow from what's being done internally to what you're actually seeing on the outside hinges upon and is actually conditional upon the notion that the pieces that you're looking at from an individual point of view fit together correctly. And that composability, as you mentioned, is exactly the, the characteristic that you want. You want the system to be able to be examined in detail individually, like the small pieces of a watch before you put them together, but you want the whole thing eventually to start something ticking. So you need that integration to occur, and then you want that integration to occur at the level at which the properties that you're looking for from the outside are actually being fulfilled. And so one of the tools that we found quite useful that allows us to actually nest or embed a lot of the dynamical systems uh, approach that, that the GDS, the generalized dynamical systems uh, theory would allow us to, to work with is in a, a part of applied mathematics called category theory, which loosely speaking is something which allows you to take a bunch of stuff 
and look at how they're connected to each other. What are the relationships between collections of objects? And in doing so, look at the linkages that exist between them so that when you put them together, they do compose in a consistent fashion. And then that consistency, you're with an eye towards saying, well, okay, given that I have this type of composable system, what is it that I can guarantee as properties or find very likely? And of course, mechanism design is turning that around a bit and saying, given the properties that I want to have, what types of composability families or classes actually exist that are feasible versus the ones that I would love to have, but turn out not to actually be operationally possible. Yeah. Speaking of category theory, I think it's a, um, it's something that's been really interesting to learn of late. It wasn't the primary mathematical methods that, that I studied. Um, I definitely came more from the generalized dynamical systems, the di dynamical systems, which we then generalized towards the, or we used existing generalizations that were useful for our, um, our mechanism design work. But upon sort of developing or beginning to develop an understanding of category theory, I, I've sort of come to understand it as a descriptive language in applied mathematics. So like, again, if you if you apply category theory, you generally do it by pointing it at an existing mathematical construction, translating into a category theoretic representation, but then using the sort of power of category theory to expose similarities, relationships between different mathematical structures to, you know, quote unquote, get stuff for free, right? If you're able to say, well, we constructed the mathematical objects that we needed to do our work, and they were bespoke in some sense, then once you translate them into a category theoretic lens, um, what you get is a sense of what other things they are or not equipped or are or are not equivalent to, or the circumstances under which they would be equivalent to other structures with a lot of well-known properties. So instead of having to reinvent the wheel in terms of certain properties of certain mathematical structures, you can say, aha, now that I've constructed the thing that I need, that, that represents my problem well, and examined, uh, examined it through the lens of category theory, I can see that which it is the similar to or the same as. And that gives me a much better sense of what properties those mathematical objects have. Um, but separately from that, I think one of the main value propositions of, of category theory within this um, area of applied math is that uh, to Jean-Michel's point earlier, it really emphasizes composability. And that's already something that we were um, pretty dived into. Um, much of our design work relies on being able to make assumptions about behavior uh, of the like the properties of a system with relatively weak or borderline non-existent behavioral assumptions. And that's what gives us strong composability properties. And that's what actually led us to really focusing on things like energy functions. Because as in the physical world, if you bake energy functions into your systems that can't be violated by any combination of mechanisms, then it doesn't actually matter why you're doing things. You can't break uh, the law of conservation of mass and energy just because you came up with a new cool idea, right? You're stuck with that one. And so if you actually embed in your mechanism design concepts that are mathematically analogous to energy functions, then the properties that are um, associated with those energy functions are the ones that will stand up to composition, even with unknown future systems, you know, game mining, which, you know, mutates incentives. So there's a wide range of possibilities. And um, I would like to talk a bit with you about, you know, why and how we are able to sort of weaken the assumptions that we make about user behavior and thus, um, you know, aim to design mechanisms which are a bit more resistant to sort of changes in the behavioral context in which agents make decisions. Yeah, I think that would be a, a great element to dig into. And especially from there, maybe even jumping into some concrete examples, if y'all are both willing to share in terms of how you've actually applied some of this uh, in, in sort of some real work done at Block Science and, and help uh, quantify it a little more clearly for those who are not coming from these disciplines. And it might be the first time they're interacting with some of these concepts. Yeah, I think that's a nice set of, a nice segue to kind of look at the the, the way in which you would normally proceed, which would be to say, well, we have a particular kind of behavior that we, we believe individuals have because there's a certain rationality threshold that we want to, to, to either enforce or to impose or to simply say, hey, if there's money left on the table, then somebody sooner or later is going to figure out that there's money left on the table and they should take it. And then the behaviors that are consistent with that uh, in, in a lot of economic analysis are used as the point of departure. 
So you start with the behavioral assumption and then you derive the properties that are consistent with that particular assumption, an assumption of rationality or more bounded rationality, an assumption of a type of learning that is going on, whether that's uh, some kind of a, a Bayesian updating uh, or examining a game structure in a game theoretic sense and saying, aha, there's a focal point or, or an, a Nash equilibrium where I can understand what my impact of my decisions are on others. But when you look at a system that you're attempting to design, very often you don't have that luxury of specifying precisely how an individual is going to interact nor do you have the luxury to, to say that they are going to understand the system, especially a complex system, to the sufficient degree that they will always find the money that's sort of left on the table, those ways of actually gaming the, system, gaming the system or understanding the system. So as a result, you look instead for those properties that are, in a sense, agnostic to the behaviors that generate actions and instead look at what actions are admissible from one period to the next. And that allows your dynamical system to retain the flexibility of being able to incorporate any behavior that allows that interface between what people think and what they're allowed to do. So instead of assuming the behavior, you essentially say, well, what's your gateway into the system? Well, we can make that as res restrictive or as broad as we would like in the mechanism design. We can say you can choose from these options. And then provided that those are the options that are structured, you can specify what will happen to the system from that point forward. And then people are free to choose. They don't have to have a behavioral assumption. You've made the system, hopefully, at that point, engineered such that the mechanisms that are kind of consistent with the provision of those choices are things that replicate or provide guarantees for, up to a certain level of tolerance, desirable properties that you might have. And this would be something along the same lines of, of uh, and I think we've, we've you know, Zargon, we've used this analogy many times in the past, a bridge bridge building or, or the ability to create, regardless of whether we have social conventions of driving on the right-hand side or the left-hand side, people can still choose to drive differently than we would expect. You still want, for example, driving over a bridge to not become catastrophic for everyone if one individual decides to change their focal point. Yeah. And, you know, the, this sort of separation that we talked about earlier between sort of inward looking and outward looking also um, sort of bears here as you start to sort of stack these systems. So in the bridge analogy, you know, there's a quite a big difference between the sort of structural civil engineering work that goes into sort of specifying the bridge from the related but distinct work to determine like how wide the lanes are going to be, how they're going to be divided, whether there's any traffic control, like are you allowed to switch lanes, you know, are these things enforced through physical blockages or just through signaling lines, like there's just any number of um, mechanisms that are layered on top to address the sort of behavioral element of the usage of the bridge. Um, you could also ask whether, you know, if you put a tool, toll on it in one direction and not the other, does that mean that you should put more lanes in the non-toll direction because more people will use it in that direction? Like, there's actually quite a few um, so social and economic mechanisms at play, but we generally don't let those things get too entangled with them, again, the sort of mechanical structural aspects of you know whether the bridge will be sound but they're not completely disentangled because you know some bridges for example don't allow trucks or maybe they don't allow hazardous materials it's actually tunnels that generally don't allow certain types of explosives to go through them and so then these are non-trivial couplings between the rules uh, about the use of the system um, and the physically engineered system in order to reduce the likelihood that you know an actor's action shuns result in sort of a catastrophic failure for others. Um, but there's this like interesting tension between reasoning about them as different subsystems or different layers and reasoning about how the decisions in one layer have bearing on the other. And so again, you use these kinds of stacking techniques or these relational techniques to assert properties of one system while making assumptions about the other and vice versa, but then also really carefully inspecting those boundaries. And so, you know, one of the things that I try to emphasize for people is that most systems don't fail on their components, they fail on their interconnections. So no matter how well you engineer that one piece that you're really excited about, if it's not like clipped in correctly to the thing that it's part of, it's still going to create a mess. And so especially with the crypto economic systems, this relates to people, you know, really super carefully engineering, specifying and, you know, even formally verifying their chain code. 
only to embed it in a social system for which it's just not a good fit and having no mechanism through which to iterate on that mechanism are stuck with some, you know, code is law style norms that prevent them even from evolving those policies that are enshrined in that code because, you know, essentially they, they didn't fit. They might be beautifully crafted, but they didn't fit in the outer system. And the thing about the quote outer system is that it will also generally evolve naturally. And so, you know, I tend to argue for um, having sort of configurations and smart contracts and specific rules for how and when who, and which parties can actually call transactions to mutate um, those mechanisms. And also, uh, I, I prefer to keep in mind that there's always the possibility of, you know, say, having to launch a, a V2 and doing a migration of some kind. And these kinds of governance mechanisms are um, both important, but also um, important not to use too liberally. So there's a sort of idea of time scales that comes naturally from the sort of control theory and systems engineering literature, which asks not just what's going to change, but on what time scale is something going to change. So this actually even takes us to the discussions of governance and the, the design, development, deployment, sort of, you know, and operations of these automated infrastructures then are faced with what is, you know, ongoing maintenance and governance. And maintenance might be retuning a parameter on a, on a monthly basis based on data, may or may not require a DAO vote or some sort of multi-sig sign-off, depending on who has the authority to make that change. But then there could also be longer term uh, timescales where maybe more fundamental configurations have the ability to be changed or new components get um, composed on to the system, you know, deploying new smart contracts with references to the data structures and calls to the methods on the form on the, the previous smart contracts. And in some cases, uh, some subset of the smart contracts may be deprecated, um, you know, basically replaced with new ones or just cease to be interacted with by by virtue of the, the new software patterns that get built up stack. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's kind of a, a long tangent there, but I think it is one of the critical elements of um, dynamical systems theory is just that timescales matter. In fact, in the analog world, uh, the way that dynamical systems are generally represented is in their frequency domain, which is their representation of their natural cadences, their natural timescales, rather than um, as a sort of, um, you know, a track over time, like instead of a time sequence, it's a, um, a blend of uh, cyclical periods. Yeah, and to follow up on the idea of sort of a, a life cycle around some of these dynamic system, dynamical systems, it's also interesting to think about um, basically the element of how do we, how do we know what the, the life cycle looks like? Is it a consistent pattern of flow versus understanding the relations between, uh, you know, the specific components and it's entirely relative to the system versus how much of there is a, a generalizable sort of evolution and life cycle of these kinds of complex systems. And how can some of the, the elements that you've spoken about from, uh, you know, applied mathematics or, or category theory to other lenses be useful for groups to even understand and answering the first question of, well, where the heck am I in this life cycle? Where do I even start in thinking about this? Yeah, I think that's that's a it's it's a nice viewpoint to examine from the context of not just a snapshot in time, but across time. And if you view the system as actually being composed of subsystems that exist at different points in time, then the same formal representation of subsystems that compose together in the given system that you're looking at at that moment also extends further into time. And so you actually look with an eye toward, okay, well, I don't know what the governance process will be in the future, but I do know that I want these particular protocol parameters, for example, to be the ones that are adjustable. And then conditional upon any governance process that may occur, we want to ensure that the choices that can be made don't destabilize that part of the system that we haven't even reached yet or haven't even thought about necessarily what the reasoning is behind the governance process that is being undertaken in the future to begin with. So we kind of look again at this notion of not just seeing what's admissible or possible at one point in time, but how does that admissibility change over time in response to the state of the system itself? 
in response to exogenous things that happen from the outside, randomness, uh, changes in the structure of a DAO, for example, or changes in a constitution that adjust people's mindsets in such a way that we don't really want to take the time or even have the capability to take the time to enumerate all of the ways that that could be possibly happening in the future, but rather say instead, let's examine the consequences of what they are allowed to change in the protocol and ensure that once again, we're safeguarding certain features or ensuring that those features are propagated regardless of what we might end up seeing in the future. There's a deep trade-off between the decision to make something sort of mutable and immutable. I, I mean, any particular lever. I don't mean the system as a whole. I think a system as a whole is going to have some sort of mutable facets and some effectively immutable facets. Um, things that are immutable are sort of entrenched in the sense that, you know, we want to kind of force them to stay on the rails in a particular direction, but things that are left um, to be changed in the governance level are there to sort of steer and things that are like dynamic or flowing within the use of a system are actually just degrees of freedom left for the users. And so you always have at least these sort of three lenses for uh, the, the sort of the statuses or states. You have the state itself in the sense of the stuff that's just changing dynamically, you know, transaction to transaction, you know, moment to moment, week to week. Um, then you have the elements that are fixed up to some sort of explicit exercise of a governance control lever. And then you have the things for which there is no mechanism provision to mutate intentionally in order to hold, hold shape, hold form. Um, and you do want all three of those, though that is effectively spatial. You asked about life cycles and time scale. Um, I will say that um, the natural time scale of an engineered system is generally... Um, something that relates to the sort of two, two things, one on each side. One side is the sort of environment in terms of um, what that system is um, modulating in terms of, um, again, if we go back to the bridge, the, the, you have seasonal changes, you have um, you know, various changes in the needs of the, the people who are using it, but there's a, there's an sense that the bridge should remain constant and that all of the effort that goes into it, at least um, during most of its life, is um, care and maintenance, right? Upkeep. Um, and so you are going to have a time scale associated with maintaining the extant properties of the system. And then you're going to have a different time scale associated with that system adapting to its context. So for example, adding a new lane to a highway, that's a, an adaptation, really not just a maintenance versus like repaving, which is maintenance. Um, and so if we look at these sort of two time scales, what you'll generally see is that the time scale of maintenance is basically whatever it needs to be to maintain the properties. So people use this infrastructure, they have expectations about how it's going to behave insofar as um, something changes that necessitates action to keep it in um, good standing. Um, that would be maintenance. And just before we think that that's only for physical systems, look at things like um, automatically closing collateralized debt positions in something like Maker or Rye. Right. These are technically actions by humans. The machine can trigger, um, can create a situation that makes a new affordance, a new action admissible, which is to force close the CDP. But the, it doesn't actually do it. Um, you might have a keeper running or a piece of software that's monitoring for that status and has been given, you know, been empowered to make those transaction calls. But from the mechanism design standpoint, um, what you've actually done is had the status of that system change to allow the action to force close a collateralized debt position. And then someone from outside of the mechanism, something composed onto that, has to actually call that to evoke that action. But I would put that in the category of maintenance. Whereas at the other extreme, you might have things like um, changing the interest rates because the overall behavior is not sort of driving desired system level goals, say, with relation to the, the composition of the collateral, the frequency with which the 
um, the CDPs are getting closed, the, you know, relative um, incentives to use the protocol relative to other protocols or relative to macro trends. There's this outer system that's evolving and you might use levers like changing interest rates to adjust the system's fitness in its broader context while at the same time using these special ad conditional uh, admissible actions like force closing CDPs for something closer to maintenance. I wonder if both of you can provide, because I think both in terms of the, as you were just mentioning with the bridging element and the bridging toolkit with these different lenses and, and views of, uh, of time and different kind of ways of viewing relations here. I do think if possible, it would be very helpful for listeners to also get, you know, uh, can you provide one kind of use case or case study with a specific a project that y'all have worked on where applying some of these methods have really elucidated something, again, just for those who are not coming from the, the engineering domains? Yeah, I think Rai is a is is a really nice example because it's actually it's it's an extension of this idea of having collateralized debt. Uh, but what they what they have been able to do in a very novel way is to essentially automate or attempt to desire to automate the underlying way in which the redemption of debt for the for the collateral occurs. And in so doing, to adopt a particular pattern of automation, a particular kind of a controller that examines the environment around it and then decides how to move the price accordingly. And the whole idea of building the structure around that particular piece of the controller relies upon the formal understanding of not just what is it that people are going to be using it for, but how is the response to things that are coming from the outside even articulated into the system so that what is actually being seen as an outside impact is, for example, trustworthy. You have to make sure you understand kind of the, the oracle around what, what, what is being brought inside. The, uh, the way in which you actually examine a particular, uh, let's say, exogenous signal that comes in. Is it actually a point forecast? Is it actually a, some sort of time-weighted average? These are all little factors that fit into, ultimately, the description of the desired properties. And then once you have that desired property basis, to be able then to go and take that pattern, that controller pattern, and say, well, there are a lot of free parameters in this. Let's examine many, many, many different outcomes that can occur given these parameters and then select ones which in a sense are providing with the highest degree of fidelity the desired properties of a stable price, for example, or a price which responds uh, properly without going too crazy or having a particularly you know, limited volatility. These are all desirable properties from the RISE system so that individuals who are actually using the system say, this is great. When I look at the system and then I look away and come back, nothing has changed so dramatically that it has rendered my own investment opportunity either, either moot or, uh, or incorrect. So examining the pattern of what composes the individual system of observability from the outside to what changes on the inside with the understanding of any kind of agent behavior that might occur or individual interacting with that behavior that might occur helps to reinforce the selection of the parameters that can, of course, in the future be changed by governance from that design pattern that you've introduced as a controller. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say with Rye, one of the interesting facets is also that sort of from the get-go, they you know entered this uh, this design process with the assumption of using uh, a controller of this sort of class PID with a specific subselection of um, first a P controller and then a PI controller. So these are concepts from an basically analog um, sort of you know beginning of control systems engineering, they're implementable with circuits actually, um, PID controllers. And they have a proportional term that responds to the error directly. So in the case of the RIE controller, you've got a redemption price and a market price. Market price is an Oracle. Redemption price is something that is internal to the smart contract. And when those um, prices are um, separated from each other, uh, sort of a traditional sort of PID controller that's driving towards stability would do something like try to move them towards each other. It would basically have the redemption price chase the market price. But interestingly, that's the opposite of the behavior that um, the RAI protocol really wants, because if the redemption price chases the market price, then you're essentially inviting market manipulation. You're saying, well, if you make the price change, then the you know, in, in the secondary market through some, you know, I don't know, maybe you take a big levered position and you press the price, then you kind of know that the um, 
the internal price is going to trend towards that, which should, which could benefit you. Um, but instead of doing that, the proportional term in Rye pushes opposite the error. So in other words, it will punish the system, so to speak, for or punish the users for um, having an error, which in turn creates financial incentives to close that gap. Now, without getting into the sort of uh, minutia of the particular set of mechanisms, there is essentially a, a dynamic at play where once you account for the outer system, the kinds of uh, economic you know, rationality assumptions that Jamshid alluded to earlier, you would expect um, a behavior which is sort of opposite the direction of the Rai controller. So there's the sort of first order concept of stability, which you would normally start with. You'd study the plant itself or the, the system model without behavior. And you say, okay, well, if we make naive assumptions about behavior and just say, um, what would stabilize this, then you would get uh, one set of results. If you then extend that and build out a slightly richer model of human behavior or the financial incentives associated with it, inter interestingly, this flips the um, essentially the parameters. It, it flips the approach to configuring the controller. And so the actual controller that was deployed in Rai had a um, proportional term that is effectively... Um, acting in a way that, say, moves the redemption price away from the market price in order to um, induce behavior from users to, to, to close the gap. Um, I will say that you know, after uh, running a P controller for a few months, they um, integrated an integral term. They, so I added another term that has an accumulator. Um, this, in fact, uh, accelerates this effect. Um, to some degree, that acceleration effect has um, given the system some momentum um, that increases the predictability of the behavior. It basically says that the current trend is more likely to persist, um, which on the other hand can be undesirable in the case that um, the, the system is recovered, but it still remembers that it was out of sync, and so it might uh, overshoot or otherwise um, cause some challenges. So we've seen some interesting dynamics in Rai. There are some open um, forum discussions going on about potential proposed governance changes to the parameters. Um, some interesting thoughts about this are that the, the model itself that was um, proposed with the PID controller as the base assumes that the equilibria where the redemption price and the market price come together is achievable or like sustainably achievable. Whereas in practice, the system is a little too noisy for that. It tends to cross the line and there's like a little bit of stickiness. The humans are on, on the behavioral side are not particularly um, consistent in their behavior. There's lags, there tends to be, it seems like like psychological sticking points. And so even if you were to analyze the, the optimal strategies from a financial, from a profits perspective, um, that's not the behavior that you're seeing from the users. Um, with that in mind, you know, there are a couple approaches that I think we'll see in the future of the Rye project. Uh, one is to consider a sort of dead zone or an alternative controller design where the controller doesn't try to actuate if the market price and the redemption price are close enough, uh, which is to say we could get rid of some of the um, some of the behaviors that, that are occurring where the controller kind of swings up and down and, you know, swings overshoots and then maybe get stuck on one side and then finally pushes over and just get stuck on the other side. And here, when I say the other side, there's a line crossing that's happening because we have these two values, the redemption price and the market price. We want them to come together. But in practice, the data shows that, you know, it's somewhat difficult to, to induce a line crossing and that once you cross, you're kind of on the other side rather than having them sort of hover close to each other. Um, so with this in mind, um, there are some considerations around things like uh, creating controllers that have some extra components in them or some uh, maybe uh, a, a tolerance for uh, small errors that are not actuated. Um, also, the other thing that has been discussed is actually building automations on the um, on the market actor side. And in some ways, this would be akin to force closing CDPs. That is to say, uh, we know sort of 
quantitatively what uh, what actions would be profitable to take or would be sort of good for the system if they were taken. Ideally, they're both good for the system and profitable for the actor taking them. And insofar as those actions can be automated, we could knock out some of the lags. Um, again, it's important not to overdo it. So much like the you know forced closing of CDPs, you need these behaviors to be like consistent with the design of the system. It was always intended for our CDPs that had become gone underwater would get closed and that stops any sort of cascade failure that might occur or at least reduces risk. There's still the possibility of a, a flash crash inducing lots more closures, but at least at the level of any particular position getting um, too far negative before it's been resolved um, is mitigated by those automations. Similarly here, you know, there'll be circumstances under which the ride protocol very much demands a short. And if you short it, you'll generally do well, but like it still takes time and effort to recognize that circumstance and then to act upon it in order to induce pressure in the desired direction. And so um, again, within the Rye context, you could imagine you know, emphasis either on refining the mechanism or refining the behavioral side by building automations that take the actions that are known to be both good for the actor and for the system. Um, and I will stop talking about Rye, but I'll give you guys some pointers um, to some video discussions that talk through some of the math and the models that'll make it possible for people who are interested in the protocol to learn a bit more about how it works technically. That would be great. I'll make sure to, to follow up with you, Z, so we can include those in the show notes of this episode when it's released. Anything to add, Jamshid, on the, on the Rye front? No, that's pretty much. I mean, now maybe add just to in, in passing the notion of individuals' expectations about what can change sometimes is just as important. And so I think just sort of on the heels of what you had mentioned, that these types of adjustments that are being made um, need to be placed in the context of individual decision making on whether they consider it to be something they would either like to have control over or are happy to cede control over. And so one of the dynamics is really about that social engineering aspect of it to say, hey, look, this is good for you and for the system. But now we need to show you how and why and what it is that the system itself, maybe from a formal perspective or maybe from the formal perspective, extrapolating into qualitative features, allows the convincing part of things to be done, which is really falling more properly, perhaps in the realm of governance. But it's not so much a change in the protocol that's being adjusted. It's really how individuals who will interact in the protocol. How will they perceive it such that that governance decision makes sense? So this, well, this brings us sort of full circle to the to these. Um the kind of first discussion about properties versus um, the design. So for one thing, you know, people using Rye will expect it to exhibit, you know, the behavior of a, I'll call it a mostly stable coin or sort of a sticky coin in the sense that it is not pegged, but it does have a lot of inertia. It's designed to have a lot of inertia so that people can have experience of the property of low volatility. Um, however, that property isn't magic. It's created through a collection of mechanisms and the exercise of those mechanisms. And we have to address both the perception of the protocol and how that leads to the exercise of those mechanisms, as well as the mechanisms themselves. Um, and in particular, an interesting thing about Rai is that they have a narrative uh, of ungovernance, which is to say they, they seek to minimize the amount of governance that needs to take place on the protocol by basically tuning this controller only as much as they need to, to, um, to maintain that, um, that, that property of, of stability, as opposed to using the governance mechanisms, you know, sort of relatively freely. And, you know, many uh, systems that you might compare it to, Maker, for example, has a very large number of parameters and a very like active discourse around the governance of those parameters. Whereas Rye strives to be sort of the opposite end of that extreme, with you know a minimal number of parameters and you know a relatively minimalistic um, consideration of of you know when or even if to adjust those parameters. Given that it's a, a control system operating effectively on the human behavior side of the world, you know there is some necessity to exercise, or is maybe some necessity to exercise those um, governance parameters. But one of the interesting findings, at least you know my opinion, is that um, we don't actually necessarily need to change the parameters. We actually need to automate or improve the um, 
the responsiveness of the market. And that could be done rather than by changing the existing protocol by improving the equipment that's available to participation participants within the protocol. But ultimately, that's going to come down to whether people are um, sort of comfortable with building in that way and using the those tools as they get provisioned. Yeah, and I know we're getting very close to, to time for today. So I just wanted to, to check in with both of you to see if there was uh, anything else in terms of this overall uh, topic of the, the use of formal methods or the role of formal methods when thinking about complex systems in, in the world of Web3. If there are just any other kind of topics or threads you'd like to encourage people to explore if they are interested in this, in addition to all the all the great elements we've touched on and the resources that were alluded to that, that we'll make sure to include in the show notes. Um, just from my side, I think it's, it's it's worth exploring if you're interested in such things in mechanism design, the perspective of the, let's say the, the economist, not from the idea of assuming behaviors, but more from the idea of building incentive structures. So as long as you can take a perspective where the formality that you're using is just enough to reinforce properties that you want, but no further, then I think you're actually in the world of something like along the lines of a, of a contract theoretic based environment, not smart contract environment, but actually the old, old style analog, um, a subdiscipline of economics called contract theory, which is really about how people make these types of agreements between and among each other to create a particular distribution of resources or an allocation of resources. And so um, there are ways to actually move forward in that. I can also can provide some of the, the pointers in that direction for, uh, for, for the notes. And for my part, I'd say a really good starting point for understanding game theory in a more general way that's associated with formal methods and engineering would be to look into differential games. The sort of canonical teaching model is called the homicidal chauffeur, and it's a dynamic game. So the the actors on the in the game have admissible actions, right? Like laws of motion, how they're allowed to move and they have competing objectives and the it flows, it has dynamics. And at least for my part, that was the way that uh, game theoretic constructs are introduced to engineers. And that problem itself is actually the toy version of a missile targeting problem. Um, obviously you can construct things that are not quite so uh, negative sum as, as a missile targeting problem, but the idea that you can you know represent games as dynamical systems rather than as um, sort of flat snapshots of the world is a is a really important one in transitioning from what is effectively um, you know toy models and and reinforcing basic concepts or theories to like actually designing and testing things, which you know leads me to want to close out with a, a reminder that formal methods does not just include verification. If you are actually doing systems engineering in a formal way, you need to have both verification and validation. And I actually would recommend checking out, there's some a series of videos by a guy named Brian Douglas uh, about systems engineering. Um, and I guess we can probably get you those links as well. Yeah, perfect. Well, uh, James Sheet and Michael, thank you both so much for, for joining us today and, and sharing uh, so much exciting knowledge. We'll make sure to follow up and get some of those links to include with listeners as well. And yeah, just wanna thank you for taking the time. Thanks very much. Thank you for having us.